So just remain standing for a moment while I introduce our special guest this morning, Pastor Stanley Mehta. Uh, he began as an electrical engineer. Uh, he worked five years in the industry, and then in 1981, he began his pastoral work at the age of 28 in Bombay Baptist Church, uh, which eventually became a charismatic church. The church grew from three churches, uh, three language churches, to over 120 house churches, um, um, and uh, several of these are overseas in other countries as well. Uh, and written over uh, half a dozen books. They've started schools, a lot of different uh, avenues for social work. And so he's been in the ministry uh, for how many years, Pastor? 40, 38, nearing 40, we'll round it up. <laughs> nearing 40 years, uh, he's been in the ministry. Uh, his wife, Esme, is also with us today. We're delighted to have her as well. Uh, they have uh, two daughters and a son. All of them are married, two grandkids. Uh, we are honored to have Pastor Stanley Mehta with us. Let's put our hands together. Uh, welcome, Pastor Stanley. It's a joint privilege to be with you uh, this morning. I think about four years ago, I did come uh, quietly and attended one of your services because that day we didn't have our church service. Uh, your service was there in the other hall and uh, I enjoyed right from the beginning to the end. So this time I have a privilege and I cannot come secretly. I have to come up on the stage as been invited. Uh, it's been a joy also to work with uh, Pastor Ashish at the city pastor's uh, prayer meeting that he hosts every month. When I was in Mumbai, we used to do that. And so now that we uh, uh, left Mumbai, relocated to Bangalore, uh, I was wanting to uh, find out if there was a city pastor's fellowship. And I got an in invitation letter from then on. For the last maybe about two years, I've been attending and I'm thoroughly enjoying every bit of it. I'm making new friends and I'm very blessed to be in this city, learning lots. Everything is new to me. But, uh, you know, in one sense, whenever you go, the L plate always remains. We have to keep learning all the time. So I'm learning from other men of God, and I'm privileged to be part of that group. I thank, I thank Pastor Ashish for trusting me. He doesn't really know me, but he's invited and given the pulpit to me. It's a kind of a blind date. I hope it works. <laughs> This morning, I'm going to speak on a subject called uh, rejection. Or I'm going to speak on the subject called rejection. Uh, there are many emotions that we encounter, negative emotions like jealousy. We are victims of jealousy or envy or hatred. You could name many. But I find that one of the one subtle one that affects us, uh, many people, uh, right from childhood days is this subject called rejection and it does begin from childhood as you can see that happening to people yeah there is that element of uh, rejection and jealousy both acting together at the same time uh, you know there are being a pastor sometimes we visit homes and um, <clears throat> I ask the family well, so how many children do you have and sometimes the father says we were planning only two children then he arrived and the guy's eyes are all like saucers. He wonders, I was not wanted. I arrived. Sometimes they even say, you know, we had a lot of pressure. We had a lot of financial pressure, family pressure. So we tried to abort, but did not work. And the child feels, my goodness, they even tried to kill me, but I am here. And so right from childhood, he feels uh, rejected, as it were. There are occasions when one kid does very well, one kid does not do very well. And therefore, there is a constant uh, goading that goes on from the parents. Why are you not like him? Why don't you get marks like him? And he doesn't have any answer why he doesn't uh, get those marks. There are occasions when one kid 
uh, wants to, the elder kid wants to go out and play with his friends. And his mother, and, uh, his mother says to him, well, if you're going out, do go out, but take your younger brother as well. And he says, you know, the, he doesn't fit into my friends group. Mother says, if you're going out, you have to take him, otherwise you can't go out. And so he resents, and then he reluctantly takes his brother to the playground. And he tells all his friends, just ignore him. I had to, I had to bring him, but just ignore him. And uh, let him run. Don't catch him. And so <laughs> the child feels terrible that I have been just, you know, tolerated over here. I'm not celebrated over here. And the sense of rejection comes in. Have you seen sometimes on the playground, uh, they decide to play some game on the spot. And they select two leading guys as captains. And then the captains are allowed to choose their team members. And he says, this one. And he comes stand behind me, that first, that one. And he goes, and there are kids standing there waiting for their turn. <laughs> and then everyone is chosen, and then he's left behind. And then he says, okay, you also. And he feels, I'm not really wanted, I'm just being accommodated. And so there is a sense of rejection everywhere, in the house, on the uh, playground. You could think of uh, school classrooms also. Teacher teaches, especially the math teacher. She teaches the whole problem. And uh, she says, have you understood? And most of the kids says, yes, miss, except one, no miss. And then teachers tries to explain the whole problem again in a different way. Have you understood now? No miss. And then the teacher says, I don't know why I get students like this. And then the student begins to hate the math teacher and hate mathematics altogether. <laughs> those who laughed could be those. <laughs> And so you have, you have uh, that sense of rejection happening in the school classroom as well. Then comes the area of college, and college is a wonderful place. And uh, <clears throat> that's where everyone you look around from the opposite sex, then your heart goes uh, beating very fast. And then you start imagining, if I could get a chance to speak, chance to exchange books, chance to do something, and while they are planning and scheming to how to do that, discovers that she is going steady with somebody else. And that's the end of all the plan that you had. It looked like it was something brooding, uh, something uh, brewing and happening, but suddenly it has uh, gone. This happens at repeated times, and you have had your heart broken so many times, you wonder what really, what, what really is uh, wrong with you. Well, you finish your college, you get your job, and then comes a time for marriage. And then um, there are two ways to get married. One is to fall in love. And the other one, when that doesn't work, you have to wait for the proposal. And so then proposals come. Usually it's a lady waiting at home with her parents. Then the boy and his parents come. And they exchange pleasantries, exchange the profiles, talk a little bit. And then they typically they say, we'll let you know in one week's time. And that one week, the person is on gas, waiting for the reply. And then, lo and behold, a week later, the reply comes, sorry. And that's caused severe disappointment. Then a second one, and then a third one, then a fourth one, and the answer is usually sorry. And then the person goes to the mirror and starts looking at themselves in the mirror and say, what is wrong with me? I got the education. I got the right family, I think. Now... And they look at themselves and they say, I think my nose is too big. Looks like a parrot's beak. I think my eyes are sunken. I think my ears are popping out like the monkey. And probably my figure is not what it should be. And so they feel terribly, uh, they feel terrible about themselves and feel I am being rejected. Then afterwards, one more comes and lo and behold, he says, yes. And she feels, why? Heaven has broken into my home. Only thing is, after a few days of marriage, she discovers that actually he likes somebody else. But the parents opposed it tooth and nail, so he reluctantly got married to her. And that's the tragedy that comes into people's life. And so we have this issue that goes on. First of all, I want to say the definition of rejection is something like this. Uh, the feeling of being unwanted, excluded, worthless, not really belonging, 
standing on the outside looking inside but do not know how to get inside, get on the inside. And it's a deep seated wound. And then it says further, uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, you have it in your notes, uh, you, you have it on your screen. It says, uh, Isaiah 54, 4 to 7 says, uh, a wife deserted and distressed in spirit, a wife married young only to be rejected. And therefore that rejection comes upon that particular person all the time. Sometimes you have a verse that says in Proverbs 18, something like this, a man's spirit sustains him in sickness, but a crushed spirit who can bear. And so their sense of rejection that comes upon the lady when she discovers that a husband likes somebody else. And people can manage many negative issues or events in life, but when their spirit gets crushed, that sense of rejection is deep-rooted. Now I know some of us may have had encountered many similar situations of rejection, and some of us have bounced back and are getting on with life, which is good. But there are some of us where this rejection has caused deep-rooted scars, and those deep-rooted scars linger around and manifest occasionally out of us and cause us to be disoriented. We are not what we should be, and we are in trouble all the time as a result of the whole thing. And this is what can trouble most of us. And what should we do when we have this kind of rejection that we face? How do we handle this rejection in our life? Is there a way out of this rejection? Sometimes people have a wrong way of handling rejection. Sometimes a lady who has not received love, even when she has a kid, she raises up the kid in the, in, in the, in the right way uh, in terms of feeding the child, giving the child the best education. But because she has not received the love she was looking for, she's unable to share excuse me, unable to share that love with the kid. And so the child is growing up, cared for in many ways, but not being really fondled, loved, like a normally a, a child does when he, he or she receives love of his mother. And so he grows up uh, not being loved, therefore feeling rejected, and therefore rejection can go on from generation to generation. And so we want to see how we can, you know, how we can get out of these particular problems that come into our lives in this whole process. And now, what do people do in order to handle rejection? What do people do to handle rejection? And these are the wrong ways people handle rejection. The first and foremost way they handle rejection is by being depressed. Obviously, when you face rejection, face rejection again and again, the likelihood is that we can get depressed. And along with depression, comes loneliness. We get isolated from people. We don't want to mix with people. Those people who are depressed, they don't go to public events. Some go, don't go to weddings. They don't go to parties. They don't go to anywhere where people gather. The reason being, they feel if I go there, I might be rejected again and I can't take any more rejection. Sometimes that is one reason why some people don't like to come to church because that is a public gathering. And if somebody who is important does not shake hand with them, they feel deeply rejected. They didn't expect that in the uh, so-called church or the house of God. And therefore, they don't like going to church as a result of that. There are these issues that are there. These people like to sleep. And when they sleep, at least they have good dreams. It's only when they open their eyes and they wake up and they find the reality is so painful so they go back to sleep again. I know some people sleep 9, 10, 12 hours, but these people also sleep for other reasons. And that is what uh, it happens to them. Uh, these people uh, may be dragged or forced by the parents or some family members. You have to go to this party. You have to go to this wedding. It is important. And so they do go by force. And they sit in a corner. Don't mix with the people. In every party, every wedding, there are some few people who are the live wires. They can interact with anyone. And so they go meet with everyone and they see this gentleman or lady sitting in the remote corner and they just make their way and they say to them, hi, only to find the person responds, hi. And that freezing response causes even the most uh, daring person, 
the one who is an extrovert to feel the coldness as if to say don't trouble me leave me alone and so this is good to see you see you later which means thank you very much don't want to see you again and therefore off that person goes and the person sitting in the corner says even he went away not knowing that their own frozen answer caused even these people to be uh, to, to 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 feel uh, not wanted such people when they go home they sit and they think of all the people who have rejected them they think of all the situations they have been rejected and when they open the door wide in their depression some forces come and sit on their shoulder and start whispering in their ear nobody likes you and they go yes nobody likes me everybody rejects you yes everybody rejects me then what's the purpose of living yeah what's the purpose of living why not commit suicide yeah i should commit suicide and so this force is able to inject in the minds of such people thoughts of suicide they may or may not attempt suicide but the thoughts of suicide periodically plague them some of them do attempt suicide sometimes their attempted suicide also fails and they say well even death has rejected me and they feel even more miserable but some of them are successful and that's the end of the story this is how they wrongly handle about their rejection by being depressed satan hates what god loves and if there is any way he can get rid of us he would do all that he can and therefore he sends these suicidal demonic forces to cause us to end our lives this is one way some people handle rejection then there is another way people handle rejection and that is by putting on a mask they put on a masks they may be one thing on the inside but totally different on the outside if the first category experience depression and do not go to the party this kind does go to the party in fact he is the life of the party he can he knows everything that one should know his general knowledge is too good his ability to crack jokes is too good he is the life of the party he entertains everyone everybody is happy to be around such a person because they can really uh, make people uh, rejoice happy laugh every the only thing they never talk about they can talk about anything but they never talk about is themselves and the reason they don't talk about themselves is they feel if they know what i really am then like i have been rejected so many times they will know who i am and they will reject me now no 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 i can't handle that more and so they never they never share about themselves and when you do not share about your own self you never have a good friend you never had some friend with whom you can trust you remain isolated so after entertaining the whole world in the party when they go back home they go back home very lonely they go back home very discouraged such people lie down in bed before going to sleep and feel i don't have a friend i don't have anyone who takes interest in me i don't know how to make friends i can entertain people but i don't know and as they think about it tears roll down their eyes and make their pillow wet and on a wet pillow eventually they fall asleep so here is a double life they live one which is of pain loneliness sorrow sadness but they are the life of the party this double nature is a hypocritical nature and god doesn't like hypocrisy you know jesus was gracious to even the worst of sinners but when he saw the pharisees who were hypocritical he he lashed out against them he doesn't like hypocrisy but that is what happens for some people who wrongly handle their rejection and the third way some people handle rejection uh, is by uh, being very angry in their whole process and therefore they are filled with a desire for anger and revenge these are the peoples who don't go to sleep but their eyes are wide open and they are thinking in their mind of all the dialogues that they have experienced from people who have rejected them maybe the one who rejected them is prakash and so they have an ongoing 
70 mm movie going on with Prakash. And they think, if Prakash came now, and if Prakash said this, then I will say this. And if he said this, and I will say this. And if he said that, then I will say this. And in their mind, they are almost hammered Prakash a number of times. They don't think of suicide, but they do think of murder. Either case, the goal of the enemy is fulfilled. Either kill yourself by suicide or kill someone else by murder. They can remember hardcore data. They can remember you, Prakash, were wearing blue shirt on July 5th in the year 1985. And you said this to me. And if at all Prakash comes again and says something else into their memory, this data is also added. Their hard disk becomes bigger and bigger as they store on more and more data. And as a result of which, they are all always brewing with anger, bitterness, resentment, thoughts of murder. Of course, they will not murder anybody because of the laws of the land, but they will murder many people in their, in their mind. Now, there may be one particular Prakash who may have had a problem with, with whom they had a problem with. But sooner or later, when they meet somebody else called Prakash, all those emotions surface up and they are angry with anybody called Prakash. I hope nobody is here with Prakash, but that's an example. <laughs> and so these three types of reactions, wrong reaction, whether it is depression, whether it is, uh, you know, this masking or whether it is, uh, whether it is revenge or anger or bitterness or murderous thoughts, all three are not God glorifying. That's not how God wants us to handle whatever we are doing. He wants us to handle ourselves in an appropriate way. How can we handle these issues that we are facing in our life? And the only way we can do it is by coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ came precisely for this very reason. And it says for us in the Bible in Isaiah 53 verse 4 and 5, surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, afflicted. But he was pierced for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Such, uh, some of us have turned to his own way. Uh, each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has uh, put on him the iniquity of us all. I want to say that, this is what I want to say, is that if I were to take this, maybe I would take this glass, and if I were to think, I want to use your imagination, if the rejection we have faced, if that rejection, if it were possible, if that rejection could be squeezed out like a juice into this glass, then this glass would contain the ugliest juice called rejection, juice of rejection. I may want to add some more ugly juice in this and all my sin can be squeezed in it, then this would contain sin and rejection. I could do something more. I could take all the curses that we have and squeeze it out and this glass would contain all the uh, curses of the whole world. I could take sicknesses and I could take all the negative things that we face in life and squeeze it out, then this particular cup would be the ugliest, poisonous, most dangerous cup that is there in the whole world. And if I may make it even more uglier by saying this contains not only my rejection, my curses, my sin, my sickness, but let's say it is the sin and sickness and rejection of the whole world is put into this glass, then this is the ugliest, most dangerous glass that we could think of. And this is your glass and my glass. This is something we have been drinking from childhood. And this tastes bitter in our life. And this is what causes us to lose our peace of mind and our joy. And we are drinking of this because this is our portion with which we are born through the sin of Adam that has come to us down the generation line. This is our portion and we drink of it daily. And our father in heaven who looked at us drinking of this glass and he said, enough is enough. I do not want my children to drink of this glass. How can I 
cause this class to pass away from my children. And the only way it could be done was this, someone else who was spotless and pure human being who could take this glass as a punishment for all that we have done and drink of all of this, only then we could be free because someone else is willing to drink of this cup. And that is why when Father expressed this desire, Jesus, the second person of Trinity, made his wish into a command for himself. And it says in Philippians 2, he did not consider his throne or his status or his position to be something as something to grasp, but he let go of his royal robes, let go of his so-called position in heaven, and he took on the form of man, he took on the form of an ordinary man, he wore our clothes, he wore, walked, he walked on our roads, he wore our shoes, and he came to drink of this particular cup. Recall in the garden of Gethsemane, an angel came, brought him this cup. An angel came and brought him this cup. And he looked at this cup. Now he was the pure, holy son of God. Absolutely righteous, without sin. He looked at this cup. And in it was disgusting things like sin and sickness and rejection and curses. And immediately he, he was repelled by it. And he said, let this cup pass away from me. But that very moment, the father said, in that case, my people will have to drink it. And Jesus said, in that case, not my will, but your will be done. And that moment in the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus took that cup and he drank it and he drank it and he drank it till the very last drop. He drank of our cup of rejection. How do we know he drank from our cup of rejection? If you could possibly in your imagination walk with me to that courtroom of Pilate. Imagine this is the courtroom of Pilate. Imagine Pilate is seated on his throne. Imagine all the people have assembled here. And we have a small picture to describe that. And there is Jesus right arrested hands are bound, made to stand right in front of Pilate, surrounded by lots and lots of people. And there is Jesus there being tried in the courtroom of Pilate. And we all want to see, did he drink of my cup of rejection? Because it did, he did so, figuratively speaking, in the garden of Gethsemane. On surrounding Jesus, let us, dis, let, let us segregate the people in different categories. Surrounding that place, what the bunch of people called the Pharisees, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders of those days who knew their Bible thoroughly well. And if they knew their Bible thoroughly well, they could have identified that every prophetic word that is spoken in the Bible is being fulfilled in Jesus. And they are the ones who should have said, behold the lamp of God, behold the Messiah. Unfortunately, because they were ruled by envy and jealousy, they could not see the success and the popularity of Jesus and with the glances of, with the lenses of uh, uh, envy and jealousy, they could only spew out hatred against the popularity of Jesus. And they were the ones, instead of promoting him, they plotted against him for his death. They were the one who did the scheming behind the scenes. They were the ones who engineered his arrest. They were the ones who brought him right in front of Pilate. And so, Jesus, if you like, was rejected by the religious system of his day. No different from some of us, not all, but some of us have had bad experiences, perhaps in some other church that you have been part of, where you have been let down by the so-called religious leaders. You held somebody in high honor in a particular place, and then you saw something, or you experienced something, or, or you, 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 you knew something which caused you to have a heartbreak because those from whom you expected something great, they were the ones who disappointed you. There are many scandals all across India, all across the world happening in churches. And there are many cases of abuse, many kinds of abuse, verbal abuse, sexual abuse, 
that is happening in churches. And therefore, so-called religious priests, so-called uh, this religious system is letting down. People have abandoned the religion, abandoned God and abandoned because they have felt deeply rejected by the religious system. And you could be one seated here hurting some hangover from the past till there. And you wonder, nobody has gone through what I have gone through. Nobody can understand. Who can understand religious system letting you down? And Jesus would say, bring your cup. I also was let down by religious system. I also was let down. They plotted and schemed. They knew me who I was, really was. But they plotted and schemed. I know what you're feeling. You may have been abused sexually, but I lost my life because of religious system that betrayed me and, 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 and uh, tried me in the courtroom. So Jesus says, I understand. Come, we have a high priest who understands. He said, come, bring me your glass. Don't drink of it. Don't suffer. Bring me your glass. And in this class, he is drinking of that very cup. Let us shift our focus from the religious leaders to the Am Janta, the people, the public. Now, people, you know, 5,000 were fed. 4,000 were fed. Those were only men besides women and children. That means I think if there were families of four or five, 20,000, 30,000, 50,000, I do not know, big number. Multitudes came to him, great multitudes came to him and he healed them all. So by people, by thousands, tens of thousands, perhaps lakhs of people were healed by him. He set those who were demonized free. Those whose eyes were blind, he made them see. Those who were dead, he raised them back from death. In other words, he was only a source of blessing, a blessing upon blessing. And I would think that those who received him, uh, those who received blessings from him, would stop the religious leaders and say, don't touch him. He is our Messiah. He is our Savior. He is our King. Don't touch him. But unfortunately, on that very day, these very masses, egged on by the religious leaders, shouted, crucify him, crucify him. He came to his own. But his own received him not, says the Bible. For people like us who have come from Bombay, the Bombay houses, unlike Bangalore houses, Bombay houses are matchbox houses, very small. We never have any one piece of furniture. Every furniture is two in one, three in one, four in one. <laughs> Daytime it is a sofa, nighttime it is a sofa, come bed, and there is also cupboard storage inside. Everything is two in one, three in one. And we have very limited space. And... Um, uh, sometimes then our country cousin comes from the country for his higher education. So within our matchbox homes, we have to make arrangements. You can also sleep there. And then we, we make provision for him or her three, four years of his uh, course that is there, Mumbai University course. He finishes his course, then he gets a job. And then after he gets job, he's still living in a house. And then eventually he gets married. So then he finds his another matchbox house. And so there he moves in. And what we find is, after he leaves our house, he goes to the hometown and maligns us. Speaks all negative things about us. This is called being namak haram, in say in Hindi. That means eaten my salt and we have betrayed my salt. And that's why we feel most hurt when one whom we have blessed in our matchbox home, making provision in our facility, ate our food, we made, we made, uh, we squeezed ourselves in order to accommodate you. And this is how you return. And therefore, you feel very upset, very hurt by your people, and you are you you feel let down by the whole people. You you feel angry with the person concerned, and you feel my own person whom I cared for rejected me, and you feel does anyone understand? And Jesus says, I understand. Come, come, come to me with your glass. I came to my own. I blessed them. I fed the 5,000, the 4,000. I Multitudes are healed. But they all shouted that day, crucify him. I understand what you feel. We have a high priest who really understands. We have exactly the best high priest one could think of. And he says, give me your glass. And he takes off this glass and he drinks on our behalf to the very last. We don't have to drink that, that, that particular thing. So we looked at the the religious leaders, we looked at the, uh, the, the public that is there. We now look at the political system, the legal system, Pilate. Pilate represented the Roman government. The Roman law is considered to be a fantastic law. Most of the laws in the nations even now are designed after Roman law. The Roman law was a just law and the Roman law said the innocent must be set free and the guilty must be punished. Pilate examined Jesus and said he is not guilty. 
he sent for a second opinion from Herod and Herod said he is not guilty, he is innocent. And Pilate's wife sent him a note, have nothing to do with this innocent man. In other words, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, it was established that Jesus was not guilty, innocent. And the Bible says, in Matthew 27, it says, and Pilate knew it was out of envy and jealousy that the Pharisees had handed over Jesus. He knew who was guilty. And yet on that day, he should have actually set the innocent free and caught hold of the guilty ones. But the pressure, the political pressure came so much heavily upon him that he took out his pen and he signed the death warrant. The corridors of the courtroom of justice became the corridors of the courtroom of injustice. No different from some of our courtrooms that are there. You know that the innocent are jailed and the guilty are bailed. We have more than two crore cases pending in India. You can feel somebody just got released after 23 years after he was found innocent. 23 years he was wrongly accused and he spent bulk of his life that is the corridors of injustice. It's very likely some of us seated here may have been cheated off your, uh, you know, your ancestral property. Some devious uncle has fudged with the things and has taken away and you are very upset with that uncle. Uh, it could be more than an uncle. It could be a neighbor who has, you know, swallowed up your property, cheated you and so on and so forth. And you get angry because you feel it is illegal. It is, is unjust and you are upset and you feel who will understand me? Who will give me justice? And Jesus says, come to me. Come to me, I understand. You only lost your land. I'm about to lose my life. Come to me. And he invites and he drinks of this cup. So we know Jesus drank of this cup to the very last drop. He did face rejection on our behalf. You, whether it's religious rejection, people rejection, whether it is your relatives rejection, legal system, he was exactly, exactly he faced all those issues. The only category that is left behind are now his own disciples. Surely they will remain with him. Well, one of them betrayed him with a kiss. Another guy denied him three times. About the ten we shall not discuss, they all just fled. And therefore, Jesus was all, all, all alone. Nobody was there with him. If you are seated here feeling all, all, all alone, Jesus says, I know how you feel. Come. Give me your cup. Give me your cup. And I will drink of it. That's why I came. Father doesn't want you to drink of that cup of loneliness. Give it to me. I will drink and I will face the consequences of that. You don't face the consequences of what he says. So this is the gospel that Jesus came to drink from our cup. And that is what he wants to do. Now the only thing that is left is Jesus has been abandoned by everybody except one person and that is the Heavenly Father. He's drawing strength from the Heavenly Father. He's carrying the cross and as he is then finally nailed on the cross, on the cross as he's being nailed, the crown of thorns and the nails on his hands and his feet and on him has been poured the iniquity, the sin, the rejection, the sickness, the curses of the whole world. He was the pure son of God, holy and blameless, but he is no longer holy and blameless. He became sin on our behalf. On him has been put the sin of the whole world, the rejection of the whole world. And at that point, when he became the epitome of the sin of the whole world, the father who is holy cannot remain connected to anyone who is filled with this. So father turned his face away from him. And the Bible says that there was darkness and eclipse that covered. As if to say the connection between heaven and earth was broken. Jesus was left all, all, all alone. Abandoned by the religious system. By the judicial system. By his relational system. By his very friends. And now even abandoned by God. Up till now. Jesus was able to manage at this point was his lowermost point in his life. He found it extremely difficult to handle. That is why on the cross he cried that in severe pain, 
my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There is no one in the audience whom God has ever forsaken. He says, I will never leave you, never forsake you. But Jesus experienced what it means being rejected and forsaken by the Father. Truly, he drank from this cup till the very last drop. But that is only half the gospel. There is another part of the gospel. And that gospel is this. If this cup originally belonged to us, there was a cup that Jesus had. That was his own cup. If this cup had rejection, this cup had acceptance. You remember father said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. A cup of acceptance. If this had sickness, this had power to heal. If this had curses, this was the cup of blessings. If this was sin, then this was forgiveness. If this was death, this had life. Everything you speak of which we associate with what was in this glass, the opposite of that was in this particular place. And what Jesus says is, not only he says, come, give me your cup, but he says, take my cup and go as you go home. And that is what he said for us in his, in his particular place. He says for us, as, as per the passage we read in uh, Isaiah 53, this is what he says in Isaiah 53. I put it into equivalent forms in our place. He says something like this. He says, <clears throat> the cross is the divine exchange and he was punished. Jesus was punished that we might be forgiven. He was wounded that we might be healed. He was made sin that we might be made righteous. He took our curses that we might be blessed. He died at death that we might have life and have eternal life. This is what it says. This is the best gospel and the full gospel that you can think of. He says, why would you drink of this cup? Why would you drink of this cup? No longer need to drink for this cup because I have come, says Jesus, to die for thee. He took on our infirmities. He took on our sin. He took on our sickness. He took on our curses. And he says, go home with my cup. It is our privilege and joy this morning, even if we have been drinking of this cup so far, today we need not drink of this cup. You can come to Christ today and leave your cup to the foot of the cross and take up the cup that he gives. And every day you look at this cup and drink of this cup. As many received him, as many believed in his name, to them he gave the right to be called children of God. Hallelujah. I am a child of God. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. Hallelujah. He has put all things under our feet. He has crowned us with love and compassion, glory and honor, and has put all things under our feet. We don't have to be under the circumstances. We will be over the circumstances. Drink of this cup. As many are born of God, they overcome the world. We are overcomers. Hallelujah, we can overcome us. He has predestined us. He has loved us with an everlasting love. He has adopted us into his family, says sufficient. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. He has made us sit together with him in his heavenly throne. There is a throne room, a throne that is reserved for you and me, that we can reign together with him in the days to come. These are the promises which are yes and amen in Christ Jesus, and we can drink of this every day. Why drink of this cup? Why feel miserable? Why feel lonely? Why be depressed? Why be angry? Why put on masks? Just leave that at the foot of the cross and drink of this cup. Perhaps there is some sickness that we prayed for this morning. Well, we can drink of this cup and keep drinking until you see the breakthrough in our healing that is there. There may be, there may be some feeling of guilt and condemnation of things you have done, things you have thought. You can drink of this, of this and experience forgiveness daily. Because he said, if you confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He does a thorough laundry job, complete cleansing. This is the cup and daily we drink of it. Daily we enjoy this. This is the full gospel and we need to enjoy. He gives us the Holy Spirit so that we have the energy from inside to be able to say no to sin and live a life of victory. And so, how can we appropriate these blessings that come to us? This is what we need to do. And quickly to look at some steps. 
first and foremost, we must repent. If some of us have been dabbling with depression, that is the wrong way of handling, masking, or anger. Sometimes we are angry at a boss in the workplace, but we show our anger in the house, usually to our spouse. But today is the last day. No more. Repent of whatever anger we had. Repent and then forgive. Especially forgive Mr. Prakash. <laughs> Whoever was the channel through whom you are ministered rejection, today is the day to forgive them. Why? Because you are drinking of the cup of forgiveness. You have no choice but to forgive them. So forgive them completely and totally. And then you do this divine exchange. Today, we need to do that. Come on, figuratively speaking, I'm sure we got good imagination. But there is a reality mentioned about the cups. Jesus was given a cup. This is our cup. And he drank of it. And he says, you drink of my cup. And every time we have communion, it's called the cup of blessing. It is this cup that we're drinking. It's the cup of Jesus that we're doing. So we exchange, do that divine exchange. And then finally, we need to belong. You need to belong if you are just loosely associating with this church, don't loosely associate. You belong. You become an integral part of this. You belong to whatever is the life and vibrancy of the church. If they have cell groups, if they have prayer meeting, you vibrantly belong. And as you belong, the love of God is often ministered to us through the prayers and through the hands of our brothers and sisters. And you will continuously receive that love that you're looking for, which God gives it to us through the ministry of the saints. Receive prayers, and as you receive prayer, you will find great blessings comes upon you. Amen? All right, shall we just bow our heads and close our eyes? Just think in your mind. Do you feel any residue of rejection? Are you angry about anybody? Are you upset? Are you feeling lonely? Are you feeling depressed? Do you feel you lead a double life? Do you feel every now and then you go through unnecessary depression because some negative thoughts come to your mind? Then would you this afternoon repent and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for unnecessarily holding on to all this. Would you talk to God right now in your mind? as you are asking for forgiveness would you also forgive whoever has offended you whoever has ministered rejection would you release them and by faith would you take your cup of rejection cup of curses, sin, sickness and lay it at the feet of the cross and by faith, by faith, reach out because Jesus has already offered that cup to you. Take that cup and drink of it. Take that cup and say, yes, every promise is yes and amen. Drink of that cup and say, yes, Lord, I want this. I want this in my life. I'm a child of God. I am adopted. I am predestined. I am crowned. I'm a new creation. I'm an overcomer. Hallelujah. Think of all the blessings God gives you. Receive it. Appropriate it. Thank him for it. And finally, pledge in your heart, Lord, I commit myself to this body which you have shown to me, this church, that I may belong. I'm going to close in prayer, but if that is the kind of prayer you have made, would you like to just quietly stand up to say, yes, Lord, I have made the transaction. Count me in. And I'll close in prayer. Another five seconds. If you have prayed that prayer of repentance, of forgiveness, of a divine exchange, and commitment to belong, would you like to stand where you are? And then I'll close in prayer. Father, we just want to come before you and thank you for your goodness and kindness over our life. Thank you, Lord, that you have set us free from rejection. Thank you, Jesus, that you came on behalf of the Father.
to die our death, to take on our rejection, to take on our sin, to take on, Lord, our sicknesses and our curses. Thank you, Lord, for being a substitute. Thank you, Lord, for helping us that we no longer need to drink of that ugly cup. But thank you, Lord, for offering us this beautiful cup that you're giving us. And we glorify your name for the blessings you are giving into our life. We glorify you, bless you, and want to thank you, Lord. From this day onward, Lord, we want to walk out of this room in a far different posture than what we have walked in. This we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you. Let's take some time just to pray. Worship the Lord. Let's stand to our feet. Call our worship team up, please. And um, as we just, we still have a few more minutes. We just want God to minister to us by His Spirit. I know we prayed already. But let's take, take this time to receive. The Word has been delivered to us. And let God, by His Spirit, minister to us. Even as we sing right now, just receive what God wants to do in us this morning. Just take some time, wait on Him, wait in His presence. mother's womb. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name. And I've been born again to this family. Your blood flows through my veins. We declare no longer I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child.
Thank you. Thank you for the power of your word. Thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit, Father God. We thank you for the word that was released to us this morning. And so, Father, even now by the power of your spirit, Father, bring that healing, bring that release into our lives. We take authority in the name of Jesus over every spirit of rejection every spirit of depression every spirit that would of suicide every spirit every of oppression that would try to put us down we are the people of god and we reject these things in jesus name we reject it we cast it off in the name of jesus we speak release over god's people we speak freedom over god's people in the name of jesus by the power of your spirit, God, even now, set your people free. Even those watching us live, wherever you are, you may be in your home, you may be anywhere watching this. Let God touch you right where you are by his spirit. Bringing that deliverance, bringing that healing, bringing that release for you. Right where you are. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. We bless you. We honor you, God. Before we close this morning, as we just, you know, there may be some here this morning, you've come here as a visitor or a guest, or maybe you just happen to come in here. Oh, we're gathering here because of Jesus Christ. And like you heard so clearly and so powerfully today, the Lord Jesus wants to give us that cup to make us new people. Bible says if anyone comes to Christ, he becomes a new creation. New creation. If you've never received Jesus Christ into your life, if you've never prayed a prayer and said, Jesus, come into my life, take my sins away, make me a child of God. So if you've never prayed a prayer like that, we want to give you the opportunity to do that right now. We're going to lead you in a simple prayer. And if you feel it in your heart that you want to do it, just pray that prayer with me. So that you too can be a child of God, just like how we sang this morning. To so say this with me, if you've never done this before, just say this with me. Lord Jesus, I receive you into my life. Make me a child of God. And help me follow you and you alone for the rest of my life. I do this in Jesus' name. Anyone, you pray this prayer with me for the very first time. Just want to see your hand. Just raise your hand right where you are. Our creators will come and uh, give you a bag. So if you pray this prayer with me for the very first time, just raise your hand where you are. Anybody outside in the back in the, in the, in the overflow area, just raise your hand. Let's see. Anybody, you pray this prayer with me for the very first time this morning. Outside in the overflow area, do we see any hands there? Okay, just raise your hand up. Anyone? Yeah, I don't see any hand inside the auditorium. Anyone else outside? No? Okay. If you pray this prayer this morning to receive Jesus into your life, our, our greeters are there with those green bags. They will be at the exits and outside in the overflow area. Just tell them, I prayed this prayer and I want to receive that bag. They will give it to you. We have a card that says a decision card. So you can just write your name and number. Please do that. And somebody from the church office will call you and guide you on how to use those resources. So thank you so much for being here. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for ministering to our hearts and our lives. We receive, God, your words, the work of your Spirit. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with each of us always. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, TV programs, publications, please visit apcwo.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, please visit apcwo.org slash Bible College. Please remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the app or Google Play stores.